And it is my joy and honor to invite Pastor Parker up as he continues us in that series. Thank you, Miss Kelly. Thank you very, very much. Good morning, church. How are you all doing? Good, good. I'm doing well, too. Good morning. Uh, like Kelly said, my name is Parker Murphy. I'm one of the pastors here at Ventura Missionary Church, and I have the honor of working alongside of Pastor Doug Colby, who is away this week celebrating his birthday. And it is so funny because I talk to people, and nobody has any idea how old the man is. Some people's best guess is like, I don't know, 25? I've gotten all the way up to 60. I'm like, I don't even know. Like, yeah, Rich is saying 60. So that's our best guess. Doug, if you're watching this, happy 60th birthday, my bro. He's up at Lake Nasiameno, in case if any of you have any last-minute concerns to go drive up there and see him. Um, but in all seriousness, like, I love that he's doing it. I love celebration. It's actually one of the spiritual disciplines that we see Jesus living with his life. He chose us with celebrating all of the time. And so I love that Doug is, is getting away with his family to celebrate his life. His 60th year is so incredible. And... Uh, I love those types of things. I love birthday parties and any opportunity to be able to come and honor someone. It just always reframes my heart around gratitude. And in our culture, we actually have one day a year dedicated to reframing our hearts around gratitude. Does anybody know what it is? Thanksgiving. Exactly. Thanksgiving. And how many of you guys like or love Thanksgiving? By show of hands. Yeah, right? Thanksgiving's awesome. I love, love, love Thanksgiving. But it was not always like that for me. Let me explain. When I was a kid, my parents were divorced at an early age, and Thanksgiving was one of those holidays that my brother and I got to spend with my dad. And so we would go down to Burbank to visit my dad's family, and it was like this incredible event. Like the people were beautiful. The food was beautiful. There were vegan options for Thanksgiving. How cool is that? Like, oh my gosh, you've not lived until you've had something made with cashew nuts. It's like just incredible. The people were super welcoming. We had like one giant long table that looked like it should be on Pinterest with cafe lights everywhere and linens just galore. Like the whole thing. But as I would sit there and as I would eat my food and talk to people, I just could not help feeling alone. I just couldn't help but feel like I was alone even though I was surrounded with people. I felt like I didn't belong there, like I wasn't supposed to be there, and I just wanted to get out of there. I was just constantly waiting for my dad to be like, hey, are you ready to go? Yes, let's get out of this place. Now you fast forward a few years, and now my family celebrates Thanksgiving with my in-laws, which for some of you sounds horrible. For me, I have like awesome in-laws, and it's great. I love celebrating Thanksgiving with my in-laws. And it's so funny because now Thanksgiving is a totally different experience for me. What's fascinating is that the event, like the event of the day is actually really, really similar as it was to when I was a kid. Like the people are amazing. They're beautiful too. No vegan options, but still like incredible food. We meet in my father-in-law's hundred-year-old barn and, and there's a massive long table, even more Pinteresty, even more lights, even more linens, even more cafe candles. Like you name it, they're just everywhere. We meet together and yet it's a totally different experience, even though it is honestly pretty similar to what I experienced down in Burbank. And I've thought a lot about what made the experience so different for me. Why do I love Thanksgiving now? When I was a kid, I just dreaded it. And I really believe, as I've thought a lot about it, it's because now I'm involved with Thanksgiving. Let me explain what I mean. When I was young, I just attended. I showed up always late, because that's just the way my dad rolls. I show up late, eat a little bit, have some pleasant conversations. Yes, yes, you look wonderful. I have no idea what's going on in your life. Blessings, goodbye. And like get out the door, get back home, back to Ventura as fast as possible. And now we like help cook. My wife gets super into it. I found myself, I'm like, oh, we're coming into fall. What will I make for Thanksgiving dinner? Like who does that? I, I'm getting excited about this. I labor over the conversations when I'm at the table. Whoever God has placed across from me and next to me, I want to enjoy their presence and their company. I even wash dishes. And if you ask my wife, that's like the last thing I do at home. You know, the, <laughs> I don't like washing dishes at all. Now I've begun, I'm leaning into the mess of food and the mess of relationships. I love being present with my friends and my family, the community that God's placed around me. I don't find myself wanting to rush home anymore. In fact, I want to just linger long into the evening. Now I'm a part of Thanksgiving. I bring myself to the table and I own my seat at it. The difference is now I give of myself at Thanksgiving. Now I am a part of all that's going on there. And I think that this, this analogy, this compare and contrast that I've just put before you, I think it paints a picture of the felt experience of the church for many of us. 
See, we can attend Sunday morning church, have some of the coffee that we just heard all about, and then like, oh, yes, wonderful to meet you. Oh, yes, okay, yes, yes. And then get out the door, get in the car, get home. Just kind of miss all that God is here, extending out to you all that he wants to give you by way of community. Or you can lean into the life of the body. You can begin to get to know people and, and see how people are made. And you can know that you are a part of what God is doing in and through this church body and in and through the world. See, the Christian doesn't simply just attend church. The Christian understands that you are an integral part of the church. You are a necessary part of what God wants to do in and through the life of this body that we call Ventura Missionary Church. Your life matters to what God is doing in the city of Ventura and all around the morning. So church, let me ask you, like, how are you doing this morning? Let's try that again. Church, how are you doing this morning? Good, good. I know that it's a heavy morning with the news of Pastor Gary's life and death. I know that it is. And as I've sat and I've, and I've talked with people about Gary and as I've gotten to know his story and I've had the privilege of working alongside of him since I've been a staff member here, I've been so moved about the way that Gary lived out what I've just described to you guys. He spent his entire life believing that God had given him some amazing gifts and that he was going to pour it out to bless every person that the guy came in contact with. That he knew that God had equipped him to do stuff that he alone could do and he was going to turn around and give that back out to the cities and the communities that God called him to. The man lived his entire life serving the body of Jesus. So this morning, as you sit here, I want you to hear this message. You belong here. You belong here. You belong to what God is doing in the life of this body. And not only do you belong, but you are actually needed here at Ventura Missionary Church. That is going to be the core message of our text this morning. So if you would, would you open up with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll read verses 1 through 16. You can open up in your Bibles. There's Bibles in the pew racks in front of you if you want to borrow one of those. You can turn on your Bibles on your phone. Just don't get too distracted. Don't take photos of me. They don't come out great from this angle. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Paul wrote this. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient with one another, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But, to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That's why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives, and he gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he, also, uh, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended, higher than all the heavens, in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows itself up as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much that you have a spot for every single person in this room, in this body today, God. Thank you, Lord, that when we talk about the body, it isn't just in term missionary church, but God, it's, it's the work that you're doing around the world. Thank you, God, that we're a part of something so beautiful and so big. God, tonight, this morning, would people feel connected to that? God, would people know that they belong? As we leave these doors, would we know that you've given us individual gifts, God, and will we be able to discern how we can pour that back out into this church? We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So by way of recap, let me remind you guys what Doug talked about last week because it is important and it does frame our text for us this week. So last week, we talked about how Paul is writing in the book of Ephesians to an incredibly polarized people much like we find our culture in this moment. 
A helpful picture for me of polarity is when you think about two magnets. How many of you guys did this when you were kids, right? You take two magnets and you flip them around, and one side of the magnet, the two magnets, they'll attract to one another. But if you flip them around, there's, there's something in between them. Like when you try and get the magnets together, it feels like there's a tension or like there's a, a something that's, that's pushing them away from one another. It's like you can't even get these magnets to touch if you wanted to. There's a, a physical presence between them, even though it might not be seen. And if that is not a picture of this culture, moment, the man, I'm not even sure I know what is. We're just so polarized in our day and age. But there is hope. The church in Ephesus that Paul was writing to here was facing the same things as us, really, really similar things that were polarizing them. And when Paul thought and he taught and when he began to write on how to unify the church or how to depolarize us, how to pull us together, like flipping the magnet around and bringing us all into unison, Paul began to write about Jesus. In Paul's mind, Jesus is the only thing that could take this many different opinions and people groups and bring it all together and unite us. Jesus is the only thing that can depolarize us. If you were here three weeks ago, I preached on Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And I had to restrain myself from preaching on verses 22 and 23 because I love them, but I knew I was going to be giving this message that I'm giving this morning. So now you get it. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Let me read this to you, church. It says, And God placed all things under his feet, him meaning Jesus, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. So when Paul looks at the church in Ephesus and the the polarization that's going on there, the, the increasing pushing away from one another, as he looks at the community of Jesus followers that make up the church, he calls us the most incredible name that we have. He calls us Christ's body. Christ's body. He continues that in our text for the morning in verses 15 and 16 and elsewhere in his writings, as you can see up on the screens to my left and my right. And I just want to take a moment to kind of think logically through what Paul is saying here when he calls you and me collectively Jesus' body. So take a second and think about your body. If you're grossed out, think about your neighbor's body. You're like, yes, Lord God, amen. The body has this incredible ability to express what is going on in the mind. It can carry out the mind's will. But we are not just like brains with legs. When our body hurts, our brains know about it, and our brains begin to go and and enact procedures. That way our body can take the rest that it needs in order to get healing. And when our brains hurt, our body, we now know, actually begins to shut down so that way it can take care of the brain so the brain can get the healing that it needs. And that's because the body and the brain are in a relationship with one another. You literally cannot have one operating in health without the other. When the head is severed from the body, good luck. They need one another. And I just want you, like, just take a minute and think this through then in light of what Paul is saying about how we are Christ's body. The God of the universe, the one who breathed out the stars, the psalmist writes, the one who created you in your mother's womb, this God wants you to be his body, his physical representation here on earth. This God wants you to be a part of what he's doing. The church has been called Jesus' hands and his feet here on earth. See, we get to extend what God is doing, carry out his will, and how Jesus extends himself into the world. You and I, we make up a body. We together make up what's called the church. And even if we are wildly polarized on everything else, we have this one thing in common that to Paul should unify us and depolarize us and bring us back together into Paul. That thing is Jesus. You and I may be completely different body parts. You may be a toenail, and I may be a spleen, which I don't even know where it is in my body, right? Like you may be skin and hair and and all sorts of other things. We may be completely different body parts, but to you and I, we all have the same head in Paul's mind. We are all underneath the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Even if if everything else is different, we have one thing in common, that Jesus is our Lord. In Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, Paul has been setting up this whole thing, verses chapters 1 through 3, Paul has been presenting to us the gospel story. Paul has been presenting the gospel story, meaning the case that because of Jesus Christ, we all have access to God. And therefore, we are a new and unified humanity that gets to live in peace. He wrote that in Ephesians 2, 15. 
He goes on in verses 16 through 18 of chapter 2, and he says that Jesus has reconciled both Jews and Gentiles, which were two incredibly polarized people groups that, like, hated everything about one another. He has reconciled them. Reconciliation means to restore friendly relations. So he has reconciled both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. So it's the same message for all. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. So what Paul is saying is that everyone has equal access to God because of what Jesus has done. And that this reality, that we all now have the same access to the Father, should level us all and begin to unify us. That's the gospel story. And so now in chapters 4 through 6, with the second half of the book of Ephesians, as we round the corner, what Paul is going to be doing is he is going to be presenting, in light of the gospel story, how that should then impact our personal stories. So these next three chapters of Ephesians are going to be about how the gospel story impacts our personal story. And the thing that Paul starts with, when he, when he begins to write on how the gospel should impact our personal story, he starts writing about oneness. Oneness. Let me reread to you verses 4 through 6 and just see if you can pick up on the central theme that Paul has here. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Eugene Peterson, he translated verse 6 like this, Everything you are and think and do is permeated with oneness. Permeated means, it, it, it's, it means to be consumed with, to be spread throughout. It's like the blood in your body. All that the Christian is to be is to be permeated with this knowledge that you are one in the body of Jesus Christ. So because of what Jesus has done, the church's defining characteristic in Paul's mind should be oneness. We should be consumed with oneness. Because in, in Jesus, what divides us, what, what's caused hostility, has been set aside in light of the one who has united us. Because you are part of one body. You are part of the body of Jesus. And I really cannot stress enough this point. I know I'm going after it, but it's intentional. Because in this cultural moment, this message is so needed. It's so needed. Do you know how many people feel alone right now? Feel isolated. See, polarization pushes you away from people. And so naturally, as you begin to push away, eventually you're going to begin to be isolated and alone. In this, com in this moment that we're in, the message of you belong here, like we want to include you in, is so important. You may not know this, but I read books on loneliness because I'm weird. I don't know. I love it. It has a lot to do with the demographic that I get to serve, the, the high schoolers and middle schoolers of right now. And I want you to know this. Loneliness is actually seen as one of the greatest threats to America's health in this day and age. A study just came out of Harvard and Stanford, a joint study together, that just like rocked my world. I couldn't believe it. I want to read to you guys some of the statistics around loneliness because it's important for us to be aware of these things, to live into reality. Loneliness, living alone, and poor social connections are as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness is worse for you than obesity, they now think. Lonely people are more likely to suffer from dementia, heart disease, and depression. Loneliness is likely to increase your risk of death by 29% on average sitting here this morning like, hey, I don't know you, but we're now friends. Like, we're getting coffee next week. I, I need friends. I don't want to be alone, right? Just a little, like, Sunday morning gospel. Good news, church. Like, welcome. We're all so lonely. We're glad you're here. Did you know that last year, Prime Minister Theresa May over the UK appointed a minister of loneliness for her country? It's incredible. They realize where they're at. Britain realizes where they're at with loneliness. And on the States, we're in the exact same place as they are. It's just incredible what's going on. This is such a serious issue. I would wager that almost every single one of us in this room today has experienced the ramifications of loneliness from one point in time or another, from one varying degree to another. And the tension that polarization has caused, where it's driven us into profound loneliness, is, is so profound, but the church has been here for 2,000 years proclaiming a message against this message that our culture wants to push on us right now, and that is a message that looks at you as an individual and says you belong. 
You belong here. You belong to what God is doing in and through his own body. You are not isolated. You don't need to be polarized. We have the same head. You get to come and be underneath Jesus' one body. You're part of something greater than yourself. You are a part of Jesus' body. He wants you. He wants you to be a part of representing his presence here on this earth. And I want to tell you this. This body, Ventura Missionary Church, cannot function without you here. You are actually made to do unique things that will change the spiritual landscape of Ventura. More on that later. But I want to say this as we talk about unity and all these things, and you're sitting here going, I knew it was a cult, right? Like, (laughs) unity, I just knew it. Unity does not equal uniformity. Unity does not equal uniformity. Let me reread to you verses 7 and 8, translated by Eugene Peterson from our text this morning. He wrote this. But that doesn't mean you should all look, speak, and act the same. Out of the generosity of Christ, each one of us is given his own gift. Isn't this odd that right after Paul's big, like, thesis statement on oneness and unity, Paul jumps right back into this. He says, out of the generosity of Christ, each one of us has been given his own gift or her own gift. See, Paul seems to jump from unity and oneness right back into individuality. And now he's doing that strategically because unity does not equal uniformity. Let me paint another picture for you. Church, we don't need a thousand preachers up here on a Sunday morning. Some of you are sitting here going, yeah, we don't even need two. Where's Doug? (laughs) Wow, that was a big laugh. Gosh, the other services didn't laugh that much, right? We don't need a thousand worship leaders. Could you imagine that? No, we're playing in this key. No, this key. No, this key. It's just noise. This one got me. We do not need a thousand greeters up here on a Sunday morning. Imagine if from the moment you drove in, I love our greeters, they're amazing, but imagine if there was a thousand of us, and the moment you drove into the parking lot, people were like banging on your windows, like, we're glad you're here, brother, you look great, welcome, hi, it's good to see you. You wouldn't even get, it'd be midnight. By the time we were sitting down, everyone's like, man, I'm exhausted. That would just be weird, wouldn't it? How many of you guys, maybe you've you've ever tried to enter into a group? And you get invited maybe after work to go have drinks with someone and and they're a part of a group that you really have wanted to be a part of and you sit down at the table and they start talking and all of a sudden you're like, there's so many inside jokes here. You're all laughing and I don't get it. Like, and it just perpetuates that feeling of loneliness and isolation. Like, man, you don't belong. It can feel so hard. See, diversity is one of the things that makes life so beautiful. If you like food, think about the balance of sweet and savory. Think about the contrast of colors if you like art. Think about the difference of opinions, like the, great, the greatest thing on earth, right? What is the best trilogy ever, the Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? Star Wars naturally, but people won't let up the Lord of the Rings thing. Star Wars naturally. Think about the difference of opinions. These things and the tension that they can create can make life beautiful. See, the body of Christ has always chosen to respect and champion diversity, even when the rest of the world won't do it. Because you have unique gifts that I do not have. You have unique gifts that no one else in this room or no one else on this earth has. And as we use our gifts together, we're able to fill up so many more spaces with the presence of Jesus. We're able to represent the body of Christ so much more vividly to the world around us. See, I cannot do youth ministry alone. We have an amazing team of men and women who are volunteering and praying and serving that that get to do the work of pastoring our students together. I don't get to do this alone. One of the areas I see this most in my day-to-day work life is I hate email. Like, I I just cannot do email. After church service, there were a few people who were like, oh gosh, I'm so glad I'm not alone. I just don't like email at all. I'll do email like the first hour and the last hour. But I just want you guys to know this. This church like emails all the time, man. Like constantly, I'm like, I'll give you my phone number. Just text me, please. Like, stop emailing me. And I don't know why I resist it, but Amy Holden, our youth director, it's like, the, it's like the language she speaks. She loves email. That and Excel. Ugh, but she loves it. So it's cool is as her and I have gotten to work together, her and I get to see our strengths and our deficits, and we get to work together to build each other up and cover over one another's weaknesses. Your gifts are designed to work together to make the body more whole, to mature the body, is how Paul wrote it in Ephesians 4, 15. Another analogy is this. When you paint, there is nothing uniquely impressive about a single brush stroke, right? I know, because I made one last night in my garage. And when I did, my son said, are you going to finish it, Dad? (laughs) There it is. Um, 
That was a joke. But one single brush stroke. Yeah, I mean, there may be some beauty to it. Like, I may be able to, to fake you into, like, I was just feeling blue. I call it the ode to the 11 o'clock service. You know, like, I mean, I may be able to make something of it. But, but no, it's a single brush stroke. Like, sure, there's some artistic beauty. I don't know. If you want it afterwards, it's yours, dude. But, like, there's something about it. Okay, I'm sure. But when you get a thousand of those together, underneath an artist who knows what they're doing, knows how to compose light and color, and begins to make incredible things from a thousand single brush strokes, you begin to see an, a picture emerging that is beautiful. My wife and I have a friend named Jamie Wells. Her and her family are awesome to us. And when Jamie found out we were married, she saw a photo from our wedding. She was so moved. She's an amazing, world-renowned artist. So for our one-year anniversary, Jamie decided to paint us something, which, by the way, is April 15th, in case you're artistic, because I didn't get my wife a gift that year, because Jamie got my back. And this is what she painted for us. Not just, like, beautiful. Every time I see it, this is, hangs above our bed. And I will, seriously, every day, I stop and just, I'm like, wow, this is so neat. See, Jamie, this started out like this. It started out as a blank canvas with just a few single brush strokes, but underneath an artist, single brush strokes get to be composed into absolute works of art. They get to be composed into beauty, and they get to present to the world an image that the artist sees in their mind. Your individual stroke matters. I, like, wish I could have this conversation with you over coffee instead of in front of a thousand people, but, like, sitting with you, looking into your eyes, telling you that your individual life matters. And when you get a bunch of colors and you get a bunch of strokes together underneath one artist, something beautiful begins to emerge. That is the reason that the church is here. We are here to fill the canvas of the universe with the image of Jesus Christ. Let me reread to you verse 10, because Paul actually says basically just that. He said this, descended is the very one who ascended, higher than all of the heavens, to fill the whole universe. You may remember the last time I was here, I shared with you my favorite quote, and it's so good, I'm doing it again, from Abraham Kuyper. He said this, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Before the curse found in, in Genesis 3 that broke and marred humanity, God created humanity in his own image, is what the scriptures say, which is so cool because an image is meant to show something from the creator. So God creates us in his image. So you were created to show the world who God is right out the gate before there was curse. And then in Genesis 1, 28, God looks at humanity and he says this, be fruitful and increase in number. Every one of us are here this morning because someone said amen to that. If you don't know what that means, ask Doug when he gets back. Then he goes on, God said, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Theologians call this the cultural mandate. It's God's invitation to humanity to join him in the creative process. Notice that God says to fill the whole earth. This was, this was our mandate before sin broke us. That we were made in the image of God and that we were supposed to fill the whole earth with the image of God. We were always designed to mirror God back into the world, bringing his presence into every space. In Paul's words, Paul just wrote to fill the whole universe with Jesus. Jesus himself, after his life, ministry, death, and resurrection, and right before his ascension, he looked out at his best friends and he said, in Matthew 28, he said, look, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go. Make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very ends of the ages. Notice what Jesus' intent was for the early church and what it still is for the church today. He asked the early church, he commanded them to go into all nations to the very end of the age. Meaning that every space is supposed to be filled with the message of Jesus until time itself is done. This is the mission of the church. The God of the cosmos wants to partner with you as a unique individual this morning in filling the universe with yourself. Church, again, your life has value. Your life has meaning. As an individual, your life has purpose. You belong. And not only do you belong, but you're also needed if this is going to happen. See, Jesus has entrusted his body with showing the world who he is. He's entrusted this church with showing Ventura who Jesus is. 
And diverse gifts are going to be needed to fill every space with the presence of Jesus. Your unique gifts are going to be needed for Ventura Missionary Church to fully represent Jesus back out into the community. See, practically, it's just impossible for one person to mirror God back into all of this. It's impossible for one person to go out into Ventura and into Oxnard and the Thousand Oaks and Camarillo and Agora Hills and not Ojai because Doug makes so many weird jokes about Ojai that I'm assuming we're not going there, but everywhere else we get to go to except Ojai, I think. If not, I don't know. We'll find out when the elders and him give us where we're going in a couple weeks. But the message is this. If you are going to be, if we are going to be Jesus' body, it cannot be made up of just one or two parts. We need a full spectrum of various parts, all working together to do the work of Jesus. We need hands and feet, but we also need, again, kidneys and spleens and body parts that I don't even know I have inside of me. We need toenails and eyelashes and like all this incredible stuff. I know it's kind of a weird image, but it's Paul's image. And we need all this stuff in order to come together and represent Christ to the world. You are needed to make Jesus known here. God has chosen to partner with us. God has chosen not to work alone. That just mystifies me. Now, I know that after a talk like this, there are a few practical things that you might be thinking in your mind, and hopefully some questions are arising. And so I want to end this time together uh, just practically for you. A few next steps you can be taking in order to apply what God has spoken over us this morning to help you begin to figure out what Jesus is doing and through your life and how you can present your gifts to this body so we can reflect him more vividly into this world. First is this. You may be sitting here wondering, I don't even know what gifts I have, man. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Or maybe you know what gifts you have, but you're like, I have no idea how neuroscience is going to be good for, like, Ventura Missionary Church. Like, you're like, I I just don't, I have gifts, but I'm not quite sure how to use those gifts. So on our website, VenturaMissionary.com, right on the homepage, there's a link to something called the Spiritual Gifts Test. We really do believe that Jesus has equipped each and every individual with a unique gift that no one else on the planet has. And so this is going to be an opportunity for you to help figure out what God has uniquely created you to do. So what we would love and encourage you to do is to go online, do that, and begin to to wrestle with how God made you and the things that he's put into you, the gifts that he's given you, because we would love it if you, after that, would come to an event that we're having on August 18th at VMC called Find Your Spot. And this is what Kelly talked about earlier. This is an opportunity after you've done this gifts test and you've seen who you are and you've seen things that God has made you. And as you've wrestled with that and you've labored and prayed over what God uniquely made you to do, this is going to be an opportunity for you to come after all three services out on the patio and meet with different ministry leaders here in the church. So that way you can talk to us and hear about what God is doing in our ministry and see if God might be calling you here with the unique gifts that you have so you can build up the body. I think of this as kind of like a family-style job fair. Not a super big fan of the job fair thing, but like that's kind of what it is. You're going you're gonna to be able to get like pieces of paper with information and talk to ministry leaders about requirements for what the ministry is that you might be interested in getting into. So it's an amazing way after you've kind of wrestled out with your gifts maybe to begin and come and figure out where you can actually get plugged in into the life and the body of this church. And the third thing is this, being a part of Jesus' body means that we get to follow Jesus. And earlier at the beginning of this, I mentioned that celebration is actually one of the spiritual disciplines. It's one of the things that we see Jesus doing while he's here on this earth, is celebrating life. In Luke's gospel, one one commentator said this, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or leaving a meal. Like, it's just, he just loves to eat, man. Eat and drink and hang out with people and just be around a community of people. And so, on August 25th, we're having a family barbecue at Arroyo Verde Park. Because I honestly cannot, I want to encourage you to be there. Because I cannot think of a more incredible way to begin to depolarize our community than sitting across from someone and having a meal with them then looking into their eyes and hearing their story and why they think what they think and you being able to present your story and coming to the reality that, man, we are wildly different, but God has given us the same head. Even though we are so wildly different, God has united us underneath Jesus Christ. I can't think of a better way to represent this message of one body back out into the city of Ventura because we are going to take over Arroyo Verde Park There we go. These things, these three things, these are awesome ways to respond to what God might be prompting in your soul this morning. See, every single one of us in this room has a unique gift that no one else on the planet has. And every single one of us in this room has the same offer from the Creator to take those gifts and use them to build up the body of Christ, to represent Jesus back out into this world together. 
These things, they'll all just help you figure out how to begin to use what God has uniquely created you to do. But church, I can promise you this. If you respond as I did when I was in, going to Thanksgiving when I was a kid, just showing up, mingling a little bit, having some coffee, having some pleasantries, and then dashing for the door the first chance you get, not giving of yourself, to what God is doing here and to the other people in this community, you will leave longing for more because you were created to fill the universe with the presence of God. Because this church body without you is missing a part of it. It's like walking around without a finger if you're not giving your life to what God wants to do in and through this place because we represent, we cannot represent Christ without each one of us fully using all of our gifts. And if you're here using the gifts that God has given you, if you're like serving on things and you're wrestling and in prayer teams and all these other things, I wanna tell you, not as a pastor, but as a father of two beautiful babies and of a husband, and as a husband of one awesome wife, I wanna tell you this. Thank you so much for the way that you've served in this community. My wife and I have been so blessed with just interactions with you here, but also out and about in the city of Ventura as we've gone about. Like just, we've been so encouraged by the work that God is doing in and through this body since we've been here. So I wanna tell you, again, pastor hat off, like father hat and dad hat on. I wanna tell you guys, thank you so much for the way that you've invested into this church. I'm so blessed because of it. I wanna end with this. Imagine in your mind's eye, every single person in this church knowing what God uniquely gifted them with and knowing a spot for them to be able to live into their gifting and their calling. Imagine every one of us knowing what God made us to do and, and figuring out creative places to do that, to bring redemptive beauty back into the world. Imagine the image of Jesus that the cities around us would see as they began to look at us unified, moving together, representing Christ back into the world the way the church has commanded us to do. Imagine all of our different workplaces. Imagine all of our different schools, our homes, our neighborhoods, the neighbor that we're like, man, that fence can't be taller, can it? Like all those different people. Imagine the beach and C Street and downtown and all the way even up into Ojai being so filled with the presence of God, with God's brush strokes all over it, creating masterpieces because of the work that Jesus wants to do in and through your life. Church, in order to get to that place, yeah, amen, yeah, I'll copy that. Church, in order for us to get to that place, that place starts with an individual decision today. That, that church doesn't, that place, that image of this whole community so full of the presence of God and of the brushstrokes of Jesus all over the city of Ventura and the surrounding neighborhoods, that just Jesus is just oozing out of places, that the body of Christ is so beautifully represented. In order for that to happen, it starts with an individual choice. It starts with you sitting here personally in this room going, God, I'll follow you. I will give my unique gifts in order for this vision to happen, God. In order for more people to interact with you and be engaged with the gospel and for more people to know that they are wildly and magically loved by the creator of the universe. Church, would you stand with me this morning? I wanna invite you to do something with me. If you're here this morning and you're like, man, I wanna begin, God, or, or I am using gifts, God, or I want to begin to use my gifts, God, to, to represent the image of Jesus back out into the world. This is not like an altar call. This is, this is just a, hey, I want to continue to serve God, or I want to start to serve or With me this morning, would you raise your hands as a way to say, God, here I am, and I want to begin to use my life, or I want to continue to use my life to see your image just painted all over the city of Ventura and the surrounding areas. God, thank you so much for the way that you're going to move this week in and through Ventura. God, thank you that these things begin and start with individual decisions, God, that build into such beautiful things. Father, thank you for this community of people. It's such a joy to be able to be alongside of them, God. I genuinely love them, and I love what you're doing in and through the life of Ventura Missionary Church. Would it increase, God? Would more of us know how you've gifted us uniquely, God? And would we begin to find spaces and places to use our gifts and our calling to build up the body? We love you, Lord. Fill us with your presence and give us your eyes. In your name we pray, amen.